Hey, welcome back to the group, everyone. And we're going to jump into week number two with a little reminder of where we started in week number one. And we spent some time exploring and understanding this statement. And here it is. We said that the unstoppable church is a movement, which means that it's always going forward. It's protected by God that he is actually guaranteed that it will not fail. It's built around a mission, so not a building, not a service, with a goal to reach every man, woman, and child. And it's powered by the Holy Spirit, okay? It's a supernatural work of God and not our own efforts. And finally, it's advanced by witnesses of a living Jesus, where one person tells another person who tells another person, hey, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, this is what I experienced. And the rest of the book of Acts and story is about how that happened. And today we're going to see how the church is born, right? This week we're exploring what we're calling the unstoppable invitation. And we're hanging out in the book of Acts chapter 2. So let me just quickly run through what is happening here. You're going to read this more fully together. But the scene is a really big national party called Pentecost. It's 50 days after another party called Passover, which is the weekend of Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. There are 120 followers of Jesus who are all together in one place. And you might remember from last week, they're just simply waiting, as Jesus instructed, for the Holy Spirit to come. Well, here in chapter 2, the Spirit shows up. Right? There are sounds, there are visible signs. And this is the Spirit of God creating an attention-grabbing, can't ignore moment, right? The, the Spirit is setting the stage for something. Uh, the Spirit draws a crowd to set the stage and capture attention, and He's working to remove any barriers there might be so that people can hear the message. And the barrier for thousands of people at a holiday party like this is that they speak different languages. So one of the reasons people are amazed to hear their own language is that the first followers of Jesus were really backwoods, blue-collar, uneducated guys, right? The question is, essentially, how are these rednecks talking about God in our own language? And so Peter decides to step forward. He becomes the official spokesperson for the group, and he's going to give the first what we might call sermon in this new church. His point is that God planned this unleashing of His Spirit to bring down barriers and to make a point. And the point is that regardless of who you are or where you have come from, He wants you to have a chance to get in on this message that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the majority of His message is that Jesus was crucified, but God's plan all along was to show His power by raising Him back to life so that people would put their hope and faith in the power of that God. Uh, to believe that Jesus is Lord and Messiah. Okay, He is the Lord. He is the sovereign ruler. He is the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One. And one of the most intriguing things about this story to me is that before Peter can finish his message and even tell people how to respond, it's actually the crowd of people who ask him, hey, okay, we got it, man. What should we do about this? Now, depending on how you grew up or maybe what kind of church you've been part of in the past, you've likely heard different ideas about what you need to do or, or what kind of response is needed or what does God actually find acceptable from us. So remember, we're talking about the history of the church. When given the opportunity to preach the very first sermon on opening day, right? When people ask for the very first time, okay, how do we reconnect or connect with God? Peter says in 38, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now those two actions, repentance and baptism, are repeated throughout the book of Acts to establish a pattern of how people respond to this message that Jesus is Lord. And I love that Peter makes a definite, absolute, 100% guarantee about this, to say this invitation and this gift is for you and your family and their family, and the invitation is unstoppable, reaching into far off places like Southeast Georgia in 2023. It's for absolutely everyone. And 3,000 people said, yes, I want that, and I'll do that. And this is the day and the moment the church was born. 
The question we have to wrestle with today, and you'll have some time to discuss this, is this one. Have you ever demonstrated that Jesus is Lord and Messiah? Not have you ever believed it, not have you ever said words like that, but have you truly demonstrated that Jesus is Lord and Messiah? And if not, what keeps you from doing that right now?